Chapter Two. High on a rocky promontory sat an electric monk on a board horse. From under its rough woven cowl, the monk gazed unblinkingly down into another valley, with which it was having a problem. The day was hot. The sun stood in an empty, hazy sky and beat down upon the grey rocks and the scrubby, parched grass. Nothing moved, not even the monk. The horse's tail moved a little, swishing slightly to try and move a little air, but that was all. Otherwise, nothing moved. The electric monk was a labour-saving device, like a, a dishwasher or a video recorder. Dishwashers washed tedious dishes for you, thus saving you the bother of washing them yourself. Video recorders watched tedious television for you, thus saving you the bother of looking at it yourself. Electric monks believed things for you, thus saving you what was becoming an increasingly onerous task: that of believing all the things the world expected you to believe. Unfortunately, this electric monk had developed a fault and had started to believe all kinds of things, more or less at random. It was even beginning to believe things that have difficulty believing in Salt Lake City. It had never heard of Salt Lake City, of course, nor had it ever heard of a quingigillion, which was roughly the number of miles between this valley and the Great Salt Lake of Utah. The problem with the valley was this: the monk currently believed that the valley and everything in the valley and around it, including the monk itself and the monk's horse, was a uniform shade of pale pink. This made for a certain difficulty in distinguishing any one thing from any other thing, and therefore made doing anything or going anywhere impossible, or at least difficult and dangerous. Hence, the immobility of the monk and the boredom of the horse, which had had to put up with a lot of silly things in its time, but was secretly of the opinion that this was one of the silliest. How long did the monk believe these things? Well, as far as the monk was concerned, forever. The faith which moves mountains, or at least believes them against all the available evidence to be pink, was a solid and abiding faith, a great rock against which the world could hurl whatever it would, yet it would not be shaken. In practice, the horse knew twenty-four hours is usually about its lot. So, what of this horse then that actually held opinions and was sceptical about things? Unusual behaviour for a horse, wasn't it? An unusual horse, perhaps? No. Although it was certainly a handsome and well-built example of its species, it was nonetheless a perfectly ordinary horse, such as convergent evolution has produced in many of the places that life is to be found. They have always understood a great deal more than they let on. It is difficult to be sat on all day, every day, by some other creature without forming an opinion about them. On the other hand, it is perfectly possible to sit all day, every day, on top of another creature and not have the slightest thought about them whatsoever. When the early models of these monks were built, it was felt to be important that they be instantly recognisable as artificial objects. There must be no danger of their looking at all like real people. You wouldn't want your video recorder lounging around on the sofa all day while it was watching TV. You wouldn't want it picking its nose, drinking beer, or sending out for pizzas. So the monks were built with an eye for originality of design and also for practical horse riding ability. This was important. People and indeed things looked more sincere on a horse, so two legs were held to be more suitable and cheaper than the more normal primes of seventeen, nineteen, or twenty-three. The skin the monks were given was pinkish-looking instead of purple, soft and smooth instead of crenellated. They were also restricted to just the one mouth and nose, but were given instead an additional eye, making for a grand total of two. Strange-looking creature indeed, but truly excellent at believing the most preposterous things. This monk had first gone wrong when it was simply given too much to believe in one day. It was by mistake cross-connected to a video recorder that was watching eleven TV channels simultaneously, and this caused it to blow a bank of illogic circuits. The video recorder only had to watch them, of course; it didn't have to believe them all as well. This is why instruction manuals are so important. So, after a hectic week of believing that war was peace, that good was bad. That the moon was made of blue cheese, and that God needed a lot of money sent to a certain box number, the monks started to believe that thirty-five percent of all tables were hermaphrodites, and then broke down. The man from the monk shop said that it needed a whole new motherboard, but then pointed out that the new improved Monk Plus models were twice as powerful, had an entirely new multitasking negative capability feature that allowed them to hold up to sixteen entirely different and contradictory ideas in memory simultaneously without generating any irritating system errors, were twice as fast and at least three times as glib, and you could have a whole new one for less than the cost of replacing the motherboard of the old model. That was it, done. The faulty monk was turned out into the desert, where it could believe what it liked, including the idea that it had been hard done by. It was allowed to keep its horse because horses were so cheap to make. 
For a number of days and nights, which it variously believed to be 3, 43, and 598,703, it roamed the desert, putting its simple electric trust in rocks, birds, clouds, and a form of non-existent elephant asparagus, until at last it fetched up here, on this high rock, overlooking a valley that was not, despite the deep fervour of the monk's belief, pink. Not even a little bit. Time passed.